Amen. Let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and the guys will get you a Bible. We are a Bible-believing church. We go through book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and recently statement by statement. And we are actually in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We will be looking at verses 6 through 17, the, the next two 14 generations of Jesus. And, and we're really trying to make this as exciting as we can, knowing that genealogies are not always the, the exciting thing, you know, of a party. We would go to our relative's parties, Christmas parties, and one of the things that Virginia's relatives like to do is to talk about their genealogies, and that's usually when, when I push the chair back, stand up, and I go out of the room and watch football, because <laughs> they'll just trace their genealogy as, as far as back as they possibly can, so it's not always the most exciting thing. So we're doing the best we can. Um, last week, we, we saw the first 14 generations and how they were the patriarchs of Judaism. Uh, the fathers, in a sense. And the Jews understood that Abraham was the fathers of the Jews. In fact, they told Jesus, we're of our father, Abraham. And that's when Jesus responded was, before Abraham was, I am. And this week, we look at the kings. Fourteen generations of kings that ruled on, at with kingdoms and on the throne. And fourteen generations of kings who had no kingdom or throne to rule on. So we'll look at that this morning. There's nothing more exciting than faith in action. Would you agree? To see someone's faith actually doing something. Not just sitting around doing nothing. But really they believe what they believe and they respond to that belief with action. I believe it was 25 years ago that I sat at a conference with Pastor Chuck and a lot of other pastors and he talked about something that the Lord had on his heart and he wanted to take a step of faith and to see what God would do. And so he opened up on a Friday night, I believe it was, a mini crusade. And he had a lot of bands come out and had churches involved and invite the unsaved. And he had Greg Laurie speak at the first crusade there that was on the heart of Chuck and from that point on 25 years later we have what you call the harvest crusade that is a work of faith right there in itself and because of the work that God has done in their lives many have been touched like that and God wants to have a work in your life and this morning we will talk about that you might feel well I'm really not capable of doing something great for the Lord you don't know my background. You don't know what I've done. In fact, you don't even know what I'm doing right now. And so really to even think about serving or doing something for the Lord is, is far from my mind. I've got too many things going on in my life. I've got too much drama. Let me take care of that stuff first before I even think about doing something for God. And this morning I'm going to tell you that you need to do something for God and let Him work those things out in your life. Just this last week, uh, we were talking about this very thing, and it's interesting how God brings these subjects up as I'm studying, and this individual said, my life was so messed up, I, I just wanted to wait until he got it straightened out. He goes, it's been five years, I have done nothing. Nothing but wait, wait, wait. And he has an opportunity now to serve, but he's still waiting for his life to get straightened. And I said, you know what you need to do? Get serving and let God straighten your life out. It just seems that God has a way of doing that. We know that the children of Israel were becoming a vital kingdom at that time when God had raised them up as a nation to be a reflection of who he was. They began to grow and grow. Uh, they were beginning to be mighty. There were enemies that were attacking them, and so they had a desire to have a king rule over them. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, this is what they said when they called all the elders of Israel together, and they came to Samuel, and they said to him, Look, you're an old man. You can't rule over us anymore, in a sense. And your sons, they don't even walk in your way. They're not as committed as you are. And so what we want you to do is to make a king over us to judge us as a nation. And this displeased Samuel that he went to the Lord and he began to pray. It displeased Samuel because, see, Samuel understood that God wanted to be their king. 
God desired to rule over Israel. There was a situation when the patriarch Jacob, it was Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob came. When Jacob uh, had to run away from his family because of some um, conniving that he had done and his father was upset, his brother was upset because he stole the birthright. And so after some time, he began to come home with his new family and God had an encounter with him where God began to wrestle with Jacob and then he touched his hip and he shrunk the, the side of his hip that he became crippled for the rest of his life. And that was where God said, I am calling you now Israel. You will no longer be called Jacob. The word Israel means ruled by God. And so God's intention has always to be the ruler of the nation Israel. God's intention for us today is to be our shepherd. I am a pastor shepherd, but I'm called an under shepherd. God is our true shepherd. I just serve as an under shepherd. He is the one you look to. He is the one that you serve. It is him that you come to praise and worship and not me, not even to listen to me. Move me aside and listen to his words as his words are being spoken. That's what you want to hear. I ask my wife sometimes when, when she sits back, back there, I said, how can you listen to me share God's word? And she says, it's hard because I know you. <laughs> I go, I, that's why I'm asking you. She goes, I separate you from what you're saying. I'm listening for the Lord to speak to me. That's how. And she says, and you minister to me or the Lord ministers to me through you. I'm like, Whew. Thank God that he does it. And so she's able to do that. And we need to approach our pastors and teachers. And if you're listening to people on the radio, and we always have our favorite, don't we? Oh, I love John Corson. Oh, I love Greg Laurie. I love Chuck Smith. You know, I love these guys. No, love Jesus. You know, and love how Jesus is using those great guys, you know, in your life. But hear what the message really is. What they're really saying that's coming from the word of God. Because God wants to rule our lives. We find in Matthew chapter 1 that the kings ruled for 14 generations in a kingdom and on upon a throne. And many of them were not really good kings. They were wicked kings, corrupt kings, arrogant kings. And then we find another 14 generations where you have men who were to be kings, but they had no kingdom and no throne to sit upon. And so in a sense, they just existed from Malachi until Matthew, there is a period of 400 years of nothing going on. We have no record of God speaking. We have no record of hit in history of God doing any work in the land. Just silence. What happened in those 400 years? We don't know. We know that these 14, gener these 14 generations existed in those 400 years and nothing happened. They just existed. And so there is only one king that rules and reigns, and that is Jesus Christ. And it's his kingdom in this world that uh, we need to be concerned about. Well, where is his kingdom? Well, we don't see his kingdom. His kingdom is within us, he said. Luke seventeen twenty one. for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. And so we serve a king spiritually a, in a kingdom that is spiritually speaking that we are a part of and to continue to serve. And so saying that introduction, let's go on to the theme, the kings. Verses 6 through 11, as we look at the kings of Jesus' genealogy. And Jesse begot David the king. And we left off there last week. Now some of these names are a little difficult to pronounce, so forgive me when I mess them up. I, I was so involved with the research on everything else that I forgot about the names and, and my struggle with pronouncing some of these Hebrew names. So if I mess them up a little bit, just throw it, cast it out, you know. You probably got the right pronunciation. So David the king begot Solomon by her, who had been the wife of Uriah. Now who's her? That's the question mark. And why didn't Matthew mention her? You know, obviously there is a her and that her we know to be um, Bathsheba. Bathsheba became the wife of David through a sinful situation and we mentioned it briefly last week. 
David happened to be on the rooftop. He happened to be looking over his kingdom when he should have been out at war and protecting his kingdom, but he was fleecing uh, his flocks in a sense there in his kingdom, saw this beautiful woman, uh, her bathing on the rooftop, and he desired her, and he asked his men to go get her, and he ended up laying with her while she got pregnant. And so he wanted to cover it up, as a good king would do, that's living in sin, cover the whole situation up. And so he asked that the men bring Uriah back home and have Uriah go home and lay with his wife. And then hopefully everybody will forget this whole situation. She'll say, I'm pregnant. It's the child of Uriah. Well, Uriah was a righteous man. He was a committed man. He was a man that loved the kingdom of God. And so he wouldn't go home. He stayed actually and slept on the doorsteps of David and said, I'm not going back to my wife when I should be in battle with my men. And so David was, was a little perplexed over that. It should have been his heart, but it was not. And so he decided ultimately, let's get the commander to come out, take Uriah and put him in the midst of the battle. And while he's in the midst of the battle, withdraw our troops so that he gets killed. So he committed murder. And once he committed murder, he allowed a, a time of purification to pass. He married Bathsheba, and they had their first child, which died because of their sins. Should say, say something to us. The second child was Solomon. That's the story of her, the wife of Uriah. <clears throat> I think Matthew's point was focus on Uriah and his righteousness more than on her. But the scriptures are so neat in that they tell us truth. And that is the truth, that, that Bathsheba is in the lineage of Christ. So then we come from Solomon to Rehoboam. Now Rehoboam, we, we know Rehoboam is, is, is the third king after David. Now the fourth king after Saul, who was the king that was chosen by the children of Israel to be their king, but he was an earthly king. He wasn't the king that God had chosen. God had chosen David, and so he established David as that king. And then came Solomon. Solomon asked for one thing from the Lord, and that was wisdom to rule his people. And so God was so impressed with that, gave him the wisdom to rule his people, but not only gave him wisdom, but gave him wealth. And so he was one of the wealthiest kings ever. They estimate somewhere between 14 to 18 billion dollars worth. That's how rich Solomon was. People came from all over the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Well, with wisdom sometimes comes this great vast amount of knowledge and arrogance that sometimes you end up falling into sin you know when, when you know everything and no one else knows anything uh, sometimes we get a little arrogant and we end up falling into sin and that's why it's important that we stay humble before the lord well he sinned and because of his sin his children saw this and, and he was the beginning of dividing the kingdom of god between the northern and southern kingdom so this son here jeroboam became a foolish king he divided the kingdom of 12 tribes. He removed 10 of them, leaving only two tribes there in Jerusalem. The rest came to, to him, and they began to raise up foreign gods and altars and so forth, and they began to worship these things, and the kingdom was then divided. And from that point on, we head into uh, the lives of kings that were just wicked. They did some pretty dumb things. And so Rehoboam begot Abijai, who was also a sinful king like his father. Fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. If you are an unrighteous man, then chances are your children will become unrighteous. If you're a godly man, then chances are your children will become godly. Now, I'm not saying you know, all the time there's those individuals that struggle in life and so forth, but you need to continue to walk righteously. It's important that we as parents and as adults act respectfully, do what is right before our children's eyes so that they have an example to see and follow. Well, this man here followed his father's footsteps literally and became a sinful king. So Abijah then begot Asa. Now Asa, there are times when, when you do see your father. Now like in my case, I saw my father. My father was an alcoholic. Uh, he struggled with that. He would never admit it, but he loved drinking and he drank every day. I could have headed that way, but I saw what it did to my mother. I saw what it did to our family. I saw that it isolated him. And eventually he ended up moving out with another woman. 
And it was my mother and us kids that, that lived in uh, our home. And I saw that division that it brought. And I didn't want to live that way. I, I didn't want to have a wife and a family that was divided. I wanted to keep it together as much as possible. Um, though there's probably, there's probably been a lot of good reasons to divide us. But God has been so gracious to keep us together and, and faithful. But I saw that in my father. And I didn't want that for my life or for my children. I wanted a different type of life. I started off following my father, but God got a hold of me and he changed my life. And so I believe that Asa here kind of saw this and he decided, I don't want to live that way. And he began to live a godly life. You know, it's a choice, isn't it? You have to choose how you want to live. Do you want to continue to live like your fathers lived? Or do you want to change that and start living righteously, doing the right things, act responsible? You know how you're supposed to act. You know what your responsibilities are. Just do those things because it's the right thing to do. That's a desire that comes from our own hearts and a change of our own will to say, that is what I want to do. And so Asa is a godly king. He caused reform to take place in the land there in Judah. He destroyed the pagan worship that was taking place there in Judah. He removed the altars of foreign gods. He, he broke up all the sacred stones that were erected. He even, believe this or not, he was so committed to the Lord that he even removed his grandmother from office, Micah. She rose up a Ashtoreth pole, a fertility symbol of the Canaanite mother goddess. This is grandma. I'm going to worship this goddess, grandson. Oh, no, you're not. Not in this kingdom, you're not. That, that takes some guts, doesn't it? To tell grandma, you're wrong, grandma. Uh, you need to stop this, grandma. You shouldn't live like this, grandma. You should live righteously, grandma. And so he removed her from office. So that was a man that had convictions. You know, uh, <clears throat> Today we probably say, that's not a loving Christian man. How loving is that? How to... How many, have you ever heard that because you take a stand? You know, that's tough. Because they, they don't understand what love is. So let's just allow them to worship this, this goddess, Astros. Let's just allow them to, to fornicate. Let's just allow them to go down that path. And then when they die, then what? Well, at least we love them. No, well, you loved them to death. That's not true love. No, confront them. Help them. Asa strengthened Judah's defense, built up his army, and they enjoyed a time of peace. They enjoyed a great time of peace. And that's what happens when you seek after righteousness. Maybe it's time for you to tear down some altars, to get rid of some shrines, that old baggage in your life. Maybe you're not enjoying peace. Maybe there's a lot of chaotic, you know, stuff anarchist things going on in your life you're going what is going on here maybe there's some altars you need to get rid of things you need to tear down and enjoy the peace that god has for you because he is the only one that can bring you that peace he's the king of peace so asa good guy begot jehoshaphat another good king much like his father now he did displease the lord he he uh got a little friendly with ahab ahab had a beautiful daughter and he kind of liked her and so he became friends with Ahab uh, the other divided kingdoms king and so he befriended him and God didn't like that because he ended up marrying Ahithophel and that's where Jehoshaphat begot uh, Jerome uh, Jeram he was married uh, to Ahithophel that wicked daughter of Ahab who had children that Matthew doesn't mention in the genealogy here. We talked about that last week, probably because they were wicked uh, kings. Um, if you read about Ahithel, she's a pretty wicked person when you read about her there in, in uh, Second Chronicles and, and Second Kings. So Jerome, the daughter of Jehosh- or the son of, of Jehoshaphat, begot Uzziah. Now he was a good king, but he was smitten with leprosy for presumptuously entering into uh, the temple of God. He he thought that he could take the position of a priest. Uh, He needed to keep his role, and that was the king of Israel and not a priest. Then we come to verse 9, where Uzziah begot Jotham. Now he was a good king like his father uh, Uzziah. Jotham begot Ahaz, uh, probably one of Judah's, 
worst king ever was Ahaz. And Ahaz then begot Hezekiah. He was a royal, godly king. In fact, the Bible likens him to King David. One of the only ones that is mentioned in that manner. Usually, if you were a good king, it says you were a good king like your father Uzziah. You were a good king like your father Blah. In this case, Hezekiah, you were a king like King David. In other words, you have a heart like King David. And David had a heart for God. He loved God. The Bible says that, that David had a heart for God and God saw that heart and that's why God blessed David so much. Hezekiah began his reign at the age of 25 years old. That's kind of young to to be a king. There was one king that was 12 years old. Of course, you need a lot of counselors around you to run a kingdom at that age. But 25 years old, that's, that's pretty young. You know, in God's economy, it is not necessarily age, but it's wisdom. It's maturity and not necessarily how old you are. When I started this ministry, and we'll be celebrating this January, 20 years of serving here in the community, started here in Sky Country in our home, in a home Bible study. Uh, Virginia and I, a couple of other families, and we just outgrew the house. And I found this building while I was working in the area, and we rented this place for 14 years. And then we ended up own, uh, owning it through some miraculous things and steps of faith. Uh, we had nowhere to go, and God just opened up the doors, and, and now we own this place. Bought it for 105000 Now it's worth almost 300000 So God is so good, and he's preparing a work and we're just excited about all of that. But I was 33 years old when I started this ministry. That's pretty young. That, that's young to be a pastor uh, of a ministry. But that was happening with Calvary Chapels. They were sending out, I think Greg Laurie was like 22 or something like 21 years old. It, it's not the age, it's the maturity in the scriptures of the word and the application that makes that person. I remember the first time we had an, an open house and, and people were coming in, we were packed out and, and they would ask, where's the pastor? And I said, I'm him. They're like, well, you're kind of young, aren't you? And my response was always, well, Jesus died at 33 on the cross. That was a great work, wasn't it? He goes, well, yeah. You can't, how are you going to respond to that? <laughs> you know? So yeah, I'm young, but you know, here I am. So he's 25 years old and he saw uh, the rise of, of a great power, uh, the Assyrian kingdom, and, and he was battling them constantly. Uh, the temple in Jerusalem was reopened because of him. He removed the, the idols from the temple. They literally had idols inside the temple of God that was to be dedicated unto the Lord, and he removed them all. Hezekiah even destroyed the bronze serpent of Moses. You can read about that serpent in Numbers 21. You remember the story, some of you, if you may have read it, uh, where the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and they came across serpents that were just all over the place and these serpents were biting them and they were dying. And so Moses took a, a, a piece of metal and made a bronze serpent and, and basically made a cross. And it was a type of Jesus Christ. He said, look, if you keep your eyes on this bronze serpent, even if you get bitten, you will not die. And many of them said, that's ridiculous. And so they kept their eyes on the serpents trying to get out of there. They died. And those that just kept their eyes on the serpent, they lived through it. Speak of, speaking of how powerful the cross of Jesus Christ is. Well, what happened was people took that serpent and began to worship the symbol of the serpent, the, the brass and so forth. And so Hezekiah saw that and he says, no, we, we can't worship this item it's, it's who this item points to that we worship, and that is God himself. And so he destroyed that item. There was a point where Hezekiah got really sick, prayed, and the Lord healed him. And he was so excited about the healing, he thought there was nothing that he couldn't do. God was on his side, and so he became a little foolish. The Babylonians sent some ambassadors with a get well card in a sense. You know, hey, we're really concerned about you. We're glad you're feeling better. Here's some ambassadors who want to just say hello. And so he got so excited, he started showing the ambassadors everything that God had in his kingdom. He took them to the temple, showed them all the gold, showed them the holy of holies. He showed them all the candlesticks, the, the menorahs, you know, just everything. And they took note of everything. And they went back and they told the Babylonian king, this is a rich nation. And about 25 years later, when God was done with the children of Israel because of their sins, the Babylonians remembered that Israel had a lot of gold. And that was one of the reasons that Babylon went back to Jerusalem 
and destroyed the temple completely, took every piece of wealth that they had, including the people that dwelled there. So it was because of Hezekiah's foolishness there. Now that does, have, that does tell you something though, that God is always working things out for good. Even though Hezekiah did this, he planted seeds in the hearts of the Babylonians. God would use that 25 years later when he had it with the children of Israel and he cut them off and said, that's it. I'm raising up a kingdom and they will come down and they'll take you captives. So he used that whole scenario to do a work in the children of Israel 25 years later. And for 70 years, they were in captivity to the Babylonians. And then God said, now I want to work with you. Did you know that from that point on to this day, Israel has never erected an idol, ever. They have stuck true to Jehovah God because they knew what it cost them in the past. And that's why it's so hard for them to accept Jesus Christ as a Messiah because they're looking for a ruling Messiah that will deliver them as a king like the, the, the kings of Israel they don't want any more idols. They don't want to worship what the cultures worship. They want to stick with what God has given to them. And so God did a great work through Hezekiah, even though it wasn't uh, something that he probably should have not done. So Hezekiah became Manasseh, another evil king, just like Ahaz, and God punished him. He did repent, though, and turned back. And then Manasseh begot Ammon, Another evil king like his father Manasseh. But he was worse. He was so bad that the people literally rebelled. And they ended up sl uh, slaying him with the sword. And the Ammon begot Josoya. Uh, Josoya was a good king much like Hezekiah. You can find his story in Second Kings 22 and Second Chronicles 34. Tell you all about his story, how he saw the various kingdoms rise and fall and was very active in removing idols and reform in the nations and bringing them to a point where they finally had peace. But within 25 years of his death, the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple. And we come to verse 11 Josiah begot Jehohen. He became the last king to rule on the throne of David because of the sin that the kings had done. Now, history tells us in Jeremiah 29 and Esther chapter 2 verse 6 that Mordecai was one of the guys that was friends with Jehoiakim and they both escaped Jerusalem before Babylon came there. And you can find those stories there. Jeremiah talks about uh, Cohen removing the J-E- C-O-N-I-A, removing the J-E and naming him Cohen, and there's reason for that. Some believe because Jeremiah, through the Holy Spirit, was saying this man was an evil man. is not even worthy to pronounce his name correct. But we know that they're the same person uh, that God is referring to there and how he had denied the right and the function uh, to even rule and reign in David's kingdom. And it goes on and says, and his brothers, about the time they were carried away to Babylon, about 600 BC, 600 BC. And then, um, then after that, we come to the next 14 generations of kings who had no kingdom to rule, and then Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it was to this group that Jesus would be born after being enslaved. Now, let me ask you, because you, 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 you see these kings and you ask yourself, okay, so these guys are in the lineage of Christ. Pretty dysfunctional family, wouldn't you think? There's a lot of stuff going on there. There's a lot of arrogance and pride and presumption, you know, and, and you would think, why would God use these guys? How dysfunctional is your family? Do you think God could use someone like you or someone like me? Probably not. And he would be justified if he would to walk by and say, no, I can't use you. You know, I, I think he'd be justified. But yet, not that he overlooks sin, and I'm not suggesting that we continue to sin because Paul says don't do that. But what I'm saying is that God is bigger than that. He, he sees something in the future that will take place in our lives that we don't see. And he knows that if we just keep focusing our lives on him and serving him and paying attention to his work and his kingdom, that he'll work out things 
his way. And it may not be until the very end (laughs) when you're finally standing before Christ and everything is finally healed and complete. It may mean that. But we need to be faithful. No matter what drama, no matter what's going on in our lives, we need to be faithful to the Lord. There are a few kings that were faithful and God used them and there was peace in the land. Now the next verses we see that generation. The monarchy has been destroyed. They've been captivated in Babylon. And now you can read Esther. A beautiful little book uh, gives you the details how King Cyrus uh, destroyed the Babylonian Empire. He was a different king. He wanted his people to go out, go back to their homelands, create their, their worship, uh, have their relationships and their cultures and so forth. He allowed the Jews to go back, rebuild Jerusalem, and, and, and in a sense start afresh and anew. And it was, it was Ezra that was a part of that, Jerusalem that was also a part of that. And, and we see a couple of the men who should have been kings on thrones be a part of that movement to, to restore Jerusalem. So we come to verse 12. After they uh, were brought to Babylon, Jehokin um, begot Sheathel. Now Luke speaks about Sheathel also in his genealogy. And Sheathel begot uh, Jerubbabel. Now, Jerubbabel, who should have been a king ruling on a throne, he actually became a governor of Jerusalem. He had a little trouble there. You'll read it in Ezra, uh, Haggai, and even Zacharias uh, with the people in the community that were trying to be a part of this rebuilding, and and they kind of segregated them. They wouldn't allow them to be a part of it because they weren't full Jewish. What happened was during the time of the Babylonian captivity, and this was the, the way that the Nebuchadnezzar did it, he removed remove you from the land and he would bring other people in and he would try to kind of uh, breed you out in a sense. And he would bring in Gentiles and heathens and you would breed with the culture and, and pretty soon you didn't have a culture. You didn't know what you were. Kind of like a California, you know, everybody's everything. You know, or United States type of thing. You know, we were joking, you know, about uh, white people because my, my wife was saying, yeah, everywhere I go, there's Mexicans all over the place. I go home, there's a bunch of Mexicans. You know, <laughs> you know and, and then Stephen said, that's why you hire me. I'm white and I do your yard sometimes. Like, no. <laughs> no. But we assimilate. <laughs> we take over that way. No. Um, but that's what they were doing. And so you had these what they call Samaritans. And so you read that in the Gospels, right? The Samaritans, the Jews hated the Samaritans because they were half-breeds. And so they wanted to help. And Ezra and Jerusalem, they says, no, you can't help us. So they got mad and they put a stop to the building for a while, but God prevailed and they rebuilt the the city there. Jerusalem begot Abayud. Abayud, again, is... um, a king that should have been sitting on a throne, but we know nothing about him. From this point on, we know nothing about these men. Abayu begot Elakim. He's not mentioned anywhere except for here. Akim begot Azor. Again, we know his name means helper, but not mentioned anywhere at all. I mean, these men just existed. And that's it. Within that time frame of 400 years or so, from Malachi to to Matthew, um, they just lived. They existed. They just, you know, woke up in the morning, they ate, they worked, and they went to sleep and did the same thing, you know, for 400 years of time passing. We can't just exist. That's not God's purpose. I'm blessed to be a part of a church that has 40% of it actively working in the ministry. And we have a ministry meeting this coming Saturday, and it's 40% of the church. That's a high percentage of the church. That's unusual. Usually it's 10%. So we're 30% above that. So we have a unique group of people here that really love the Lord. And I want to get a picture of that that day as we all gather together next week and spend about six hours or so together going through a book and just building our faith in Christ very unique i want to be active i don't want to just exist and i want to do something that's unique and different and i think that this ministry is a ministry of service and we do unique things that are interesting i don't want to just exist i don't know about you i know 40 percent of you don't want to just exist the other 60 i hope that you're doing something outside of the church a big brothers program or involved in some other nonprofit or going out and doing something but don't just exist god created you for a purpose We did not evolve from some fish in the ocean to do nothing. 
That's a lie. God loves you. He created you uniquely to do something for his kingdom. We need to understand that. And if you're willing to say, Lord, I want to do something for you. I don't want to just exist. Something, Lord. He'll give you that opportunity, I guarantee you. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, Virginia and I went on our anniversary to the beach for a day. <clears throat> and I was really so looking forward to ministering to this guy, uh, a friend of ours from high school. I have a lot of friends on Facebook. And if you friend me personally on my Facebook, Ruben Solis, and you're welcome to. I don't, I don't talk a lot about spiritual things on there or Christianity. I mean, I'll post them periodically. I have a different purpose for that. I have a lot of high school friends on there. And they know I'm a pastor. I have on there. I'm a pastor of Calvary Chapel. So they know all that. I try to seem as normal as possible because I've had opportunities where they will message me on the side, could you pray for me? And that's what I'm looking for. And so it's a little different. I'll post little funny things. I'll post things about my family. And our family reflects Christ in our relationship. And they see that. They think I have a blessed family. They don't know me personally. but <laughs> They don't know the struggles. But they see that and they're drawn to that. And so this guy sees this all the time on, on Facebook. And so I was so looking forward to this. And it just didn't happen. Um, couldn't get together. And I was really bummed out. And I thought, okay, Lord, you, you're in control. Well, on the way home Thursday from the doctors, <clears throat> I get this call. And I Happened to miss it because I'm listening to the radio, didn't hear it ring. And then I looked, oh, so I called it right back. And he says, hey, Reuben, it's Dave King. I'm like, Dave King? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to call you, let you know I really wanted to get together with you. I've got so many questions. And he started sharing with me how he knows um, the old tent in Costa Mesa. He's heard Chuck. He's heard Lonnie Frisbee. He has some people that he knows that are worship leaders in Calvary's. Um, you know, so he just told me his connection to Calvary, but he, but he had a lot of questions. And then he said, I want you to be one of my best friends. And I'm kind of like, okay. He goes, yeah, because I have a lot of questions and I really want to pick your brain. So could we meet for lunch next week? I'm like, well, you just left. He goes, well, I'm going to be back on Monday. And, I'll, you know, and if we can't do it next week, I'll be back during Christmas and I'll be here for three months. I'm thinking, wow. So when we pray to the Lord, Lord, use us. He will give us the opportunity to be used. We just have to desire it. If you want to just exist, guess what? God will say, okay, you can just exist. And that's fine, and you'll go to heaven. But do something, something unique and strange. You know, we need administrators here. We need artists. I'd love to, to now I'm going to really get some weird artists. <laughs> I'd love to spruce this place up a little bit with some ideas and stuff, but we just don't have the people to do it the artwork, and just all kinds of different ideas. Let us know what you can do. And we'll pray and we'll see what the Lord can do through you. But do something. Don't just exist. Take those opportunities. Azor begot Zadok. Nothing found on him. Zadok begot Achim. Nothing found on him. Achim begot Ilalud. His name means God is high and mighty, but yet... We know nothing about him. All that we know is what's here in the genealogy, that he is the great, great grandfather of Joseph. And Eliud begot Eleazar. Eleazar begot Mathen. And Mathen begot Jacob. Nothing about these guys. Even Jacob. Well, wait a minute. Isn't he Jacob from the old? No. He took the name Jacob, his patriarch forefather. And he thought that'd be cool, take his name, and that's what he did. He took his name, and uh, it just means ruled by God, but we know nothing else of him doing anything else. We know that he is the father of Joseph, the husband, it says in verse 16, of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. That's all that we know of Jacob. But we know Joseph. And so from Jacob, all of a sudden God says, boom, I want you to do something. So he calls Joseph and says, I want you to just be committed to Mary and take care of her while I do a work in her life. Joseph did not have a part of the conception of Christ, only that he was committed to Mary and to protect her as a wife. And that's what he did. And so here was a man, Joseph and Mary, who nobody knew anything about, who lived there in Bethlehem and in, in Nazareth. Nobody even heard of. They didn't realize that they had the lineage of the Christ. Nothing. And all of a sudden, they went from doing nothing to doing something. 
And if I were to say Joseph and Mary, every one of us would go, oh yeah, I know who that is. If I were to say Adam and Eve, you'd all go, oh, I know who that is. Because God took a people that was doing nothing and had them do something. And they brought the Messiah into the world. And this was just the carpenter minding his own business. And God did a work in their lives. If we are willing, if we are willing, God will do a work through you. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the captivity of Babylon, 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until Christ, 14 generations. A lot of 14 generations there. The number seven is divisible into those 14 generations. Seven goes into 14 twice. Seven goes into, oh my math, 30, 42, six times. The seven is a number of completion. So this geology is complete in the eyes of God. Let me close. The majority of the kings, I mean, they ruled as best as they could, but basically they were evil, arrogant people. We find that there was a lineage in Jesus Christ that was dysfunctional. You had women that were prostitutes. You had women that weren't even, gen- they weren't even Jews, they were Gentiles. They weren't even expecting to do a work for God. You have a bunch of guys that we know nothing about that should have been ruling and reigning on thrones, but they weren't. Talk about a dysfunctional family. What about our families? I don't want you to tell stories. The only story I want you to tell is how God is moving in your life because you're taking your faith And it's got action with it. That's the stories we like to hear. The other stuff, God will take care of that. But let's be people who are excited about the work of God and what God is doing. And God has a work for you individually. A beautiful work. Oh, it may not be a pastor. It may be. Who knows? You might not be a great evangelist, but you might be. You just never know if you take a step of faith. But it could be touching the lives of one little child in the children's ministry. It could be just being faithful here at the church to to serve and to prepare or to tear down or do something like that. It could be just to help put together a shoebox that some little kid in another country might open up and see Jesus. It could be something as simple as that. But we can do something for the Lord.